Every year at CES, at least one company hypes a new acronym that could be the next big break in industry technology or just a proprietary rebranding of existing tech. Now, what it actually means is almost always perplexing. So let's take a moment to alleviate confusion and clarify what the different terms new and old mean. Now, there are two main types of display technologies, OLED and LED. Now, for those that have won the lottery, there's also micro LED to be added to the list, but I haven't won yet, so huh, we're gonna hold off on that one. Now, while the names look similar, the way they work is quite different and each have their own benefits and drawbacks. OLED TVs or organic light emitting diode are electroluminescent, meaning when a pixel is sent an electrical charge, it emits its own light dependent on the strength of the signal. Stronger signal, brighter pixel. The huge benefit of this is when a pixel isn't charged, it's completely off. So OLEDs can attain absolute black. Now, since the light from each individual pixel can be controlled, the bright sections of an image can be accurately pinpointed and there isn't the blooming effect seen on many LED displays. LED TVs have an LED backlight that is either around the edge of the TV or directly behind the screen in clusters or zones. Edge lit TVs are less expensive while direct lit TVs cost more and have better control where the light shines on screen using full array local dimming, otherwise known as FALD. That's the acronym. The LCDs control how much of the LED backlight is allowed to pass through to your eyes. But because the light needs to be blocked as opposed to turned off completely, LED TVs cannot achieve the same absolute black level of OLEDs. LED TVs picture quality also suffers the more off axis you get from center, but their light output absolutely blows OLED out of the water. Now, enter micro LED TVs. Now, each pixel here has three microscopic LEDs that produce the color and brightness. Because each pixel is controlled independently, they can turn off to achieve absolute black like an OLED and don't need an LCD layer in front of the LEDs to block the light. Now, the tech combines the benefits of both OLED black level and LED brightness without any danger of burn-ins. But like any new technology, micro LED is ungodly expensive and will be for quite a few years. What about quantum dots? Now, quantum dots tech is an additional layer that can be added to LED or potentially OLED displays to increase brightness and the colors a display can achieve. Now, the layer is made up of nanoparticles that when hit with a light source, excite the particles to create more brightness and a wider color space. Now, in addition to just calling it quantum dot technology, there are quite a few other names manufacturers put to their own proprietary process, including QLED by Samsung, Triluminous by Sony, and my personal preference, NanoCell by LG. Now, when we think of HDR or high dynamic range, it's usually in terms of contrast ratio, but it also refers to color range. Now, the expanded color range is called wide color gamut or WCG. The purpose is to more accurately recreate the brightness and color space on television that we experience in real life. Now, display brightness or luminance is measured in units called candelas per square meter, also known as nits. Now, for comparison, SDR displays usually have a brightness of up to around 300 nits. HDR brightness is capable of outputting up to 3,000 nits. Now, the target color range for HDR is called BT.2020. There aren't any displays that can yet achieve all the colors in the BT.2020 color space, although each improvement gets us closer. Now, you might also see the DCI-P3 color space referred to, which is between Rec.709 and BT.2020 and is what is used for movie theater presentations. Now, I hope I haven't lost you guys just yet with all these acronyms, abbreviations, and the like. Stay with me, please. There's plenty more. Now, there are a few different formats in which HDR is delivered to our TVs. Not all content delivers all formats and not all formats are supported by all TVs. HDR10 is the basic flavor of HDR that all TVs can accept. Now, it has static metadata, including the maximum brightness of the pixels or max CLL, which stands for maximum content light level. The average brightness of the pixels or max fall, which stands for maximum frame average light level and 
color point information. Now, since it's static, there's a single set of information that pertains to the entirety of the content as opposed to individual scenes or frames. Dolby Vision and HDR10 Plus both use dynamic metadata, so the metadata adjusts on a scene by scene or frame by frame basis. HDR10 Plus supports brightness levels up to 4000 nits and 10 bit color depth. Dolby Vision, on the other hand, allows for a brightness of 10,000 nits and 12 bit color depth. It also is proprietary technology and requires content providers and display manufacturers to pay for a license. Wow, they licensed that bad boy out. Makes sense, make more money that way. Anyways, HLG, or Hybrid Log Gamma, was developed for use in broadcast television. A bunch of TV support it, but in the United States, there's still very little content broadcast with HLG. DirecTV actually uses it on their 4K channels. Now it's backwards compatible, so if your TV doesn't support it, you'll still receive the signal in SDR. Because current TVs can't actually display the full capabilities of HDR, they use tone mapping. Basically, this takes the HDR brightness and color information and adjusts it to fall within the constraints of the TV. Some TVs do this better than others. Let's go! Now as gamers, we've all been waiting for the arrival of HDMI 2.1. Now with the PS5, Xbox Series X and S, high-end graphics cards, and a smattering of TVs, it's finally here. An enormous benefit of HDMI 2.1 over previous specifications is its increase in bandwidth up to 48 gigabytes per second from the 18 gigabytes per second on HDMI 2.0. More bandwidth means both a higher resolution, up to 10K, and a higher frame rate of up to 120 hertz. But there are other parts to the specification that could be included in a television's HDMI 2.1 port. Variable refresh rate, labeled as VRR, isn't necessarily something new to gaming. Now, we've seen it on computers in the form of G-Sync and FreeSync for years, and even the Xbox One added support for FreeSync midway through its lifespan. Now, it's important to understand that while G-Sync and FreeSync can still be supported on a TV, the VRR we're talking about is HDMI VRR. Auto Low Latency Mode, or ALLM, is a nice quality of life upgrade that will cause your TV to automatically switch to its best predetermined gaming settings when it senses a game. Now the nice thing about this is that a TV's game mode turns up all the extra processing that a TV is usually doing constantly, which lowers input lag. ARC slash EARC, or the Auto Return Channel, that's what ARC stands for. The Auto Return Channel is only useful to those that are using external speakers instead of a TV speakers. Now it sends audio information from your TV to your AVR or soundbar without the need of a separate audio only cable, like an optical cable. Now it can also turn your TV on when a source powers up or change your AVR to the proper source input. EARC, which stands for Enhanced Audio Return Channel, is a better version of the traditional ARC. It can pass higher quality audio streams, including uncompressed 7.1, Dolby Atmos, and DTS-X, and has lip sync correction. Even though a TV has HDMI 2.1, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of its HDMI are 2.1, or that VRR, ALLM, and EARC are supported on all HDMI inputs. For instance, a TV we're currently testing only supports EARC on HDMI 3 and VRR slash ALLM on HDMI 4. Now, it's a frustrating situation that will hopefully be rectified by future TVs. At CES 2020, we began to see TVs with ATSC 3.0, known as Next Gen TV, and as the year rolled on, they were released to the masses. Now, it's a built in tuner box for over the air broadcasts capable of 4K, HDR, and high frame rates. All you need is an antenna. Now, if you only get your content through streaming apps or cable subscriptions, however, then Next Gen TV just won't matter to you. But it does have a significant benefit over Netflix, Disney Plus, and Direct. TV. It's free, and I know we all love free everything. I know I do. Anyways, now you're a pro in all things TV. 
well, sort of. If you don't remember these acronyms, please just rewind the video, watch it from the beginning all the way up to this point, and yeah, hopefully that's all you need to do. Anyways, what sort of TV are you looking to get your hands on? Let us know in the comment section down below, and for pretty much everything related to tech, keep it right here on IGN.